Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. I'm excited to have you all with us uh, for this conversation with the DC budget and local advocacy around it. My name is Matt Gayer. I'm the co-executive director at the Catalog for Philanthropy. We are a local nonprofit headquartered here in Washington, DC that works with over 450 grassroots organizations across the DMV region. Uh, we help both lift up their stories, uh, provide them a bit more visibility, uh, and build their capacity as we're able to. Uh, with us today, we have some great panelists from some of our partner organizations. Uh, also excited for our great moderator today, who I'll introduce momentarily. Uh, so in just a second, uh, they'll come on the virtual stage here, but I did want to first introduce our moderator, uh, David Minnie. Uh, David uh, works for the City Council uh, since 2017. Uh, previous to that, has a master's in public policy, uh, focuses uh, on policy and communications uh, with a special kind of legislative portfolio of disability services, uh, land use, transportation, and parks and rec. Uh, David, thank you for being here with us today. Uh, we first met when we used to write uh, for 730 DC, a local newsletter. Uh, so excited to have you here with us and leading this panel. So I'll invite the panelists and David to the virtual stage. Thank you all. Thanks, Matt. Um, okay, um, I guess we can get started. Um, I am really excited about the uh, panelists we have here today. Um, so thank you to the Catalog for Philanthropy for uh, getting us all here. And also for the timing of this. Um, I think as we'll talk about over the course of the next hour or so, um, you maybe only hear about the budget um, when it's being formulated or when it's before the council, um, but budget season's basically year round. Um, there's always something to do on it. Um, so the fact that this is following just after um, the budget's been approved, I actually think is really important. So keep it top of mind. Um, so I'm going to go from the top of my screen to the bottom um, for panelists to quickly introduce themselves um, and their work. Um, I have been told to keep you to one or two minutes, so I'm actually going to start a timer and I will prompt you if necessary because we want to uh, get to our questions. So Jeremiah is first. Oh, I get first. Okay. <laughs> Love it. Right. Uh, <laughs> how's it going, everybody? Uh, thank. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I am Jeremiah Lowry, the Advocacy Director at the Washington Area Bicyclists Association, aka WABA, aka the, the Bike Lobby, as some folks call us. Uh, we do a lot of awesome things. Uh, before I get into advocacy, I will say we do uh, a lot of education. So if you ever wanted to learn how to ride a bike, regardless of your age, uh, we teach uh, learn to ride classes for young people and for adults uh, as well. And a lot of our classes are free. Uh, so we do a lot of uh, youth and adult education. Uh, and then we do advocacy. We do advocacy around uh, expanding our, our trail network. Uh, we have the Capital Trails Coalition. Uh, that's a part of our uh, organization, uh, which is trying to uh, uh, complete, uh, get funding, implementation of a complete trail network throughout the region. Uh, we have campaigns, obviously we work on biking. Uh, so we have campaigns to uh, complete a bike network, uh, protect the bike network throughout the region. Uh, so we do a lot of organizing and engagement around that, uh, as well as we work on a vision zero policy as well, uh, preventing traffic uh, deaths and fatalities. We really work with uh, local state, uh, uh, local governments, as well as advocates to implement vision zero plans. Uh, we also work on a lot of transportation uh, equity uh, projects uh, around the city, uh, expanding access to buses, uh, expanding access to, to multimodal transportation options and areas that usually don't have uh, access to transportation. Uh, so uh, we do all of that throughout the region. I try to keep it brief into one minute. Uh, and uh, overall, we're, we're organizers and we, we, we collaborate with uh, advocates and local governments to make our region more sustainable and more equitable when it comes to uh, transportation options. Thank you. Perfect, that was a hair under two minutes. Um, so we're going to go Samantha and then Amber and Sarah. And if you want to speak specifically to, um, you know, how your work is related to the budget um, in your intro, that's also welcome. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Samantha Davis. Some folks call me Sam. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm the founder and executive director of the Black Swan Academy. Uh, Black Swan Academy, we support Black youth, uh, middle school and high school age 
and being social catalysts in their communities, um, creating the change that they know um, is needed um, and re really relying and investing in their lived experiences, um, moving that change forward, mostly through advocacy and organizing, um, but also doing some capacity building. Um, so meeting the immediate needs of young folk in our communities through mutual aid um, and things such as that. Um, the main way we move our work forward is through the development of our Black Youth Agenda, um, where young folk identify the most pressing issues and then the changes that um, are needed or the interventions that are needed through policies, practices, um, and cultural shifts um, within our community. Um, a lot of that um, does impact the budget, whether it's with our police free schools work um, or work around education equity um, and getting more resources in schools and or our communities, mental health supports, things of that nature. Um, and then also move things about through legislation um, and again, um, and either dismantling systems or strengthening systems um, that benefit black young folk and therefore benefit all of us. Um, so that's my spiel. I'll stop there. Great, thanks, Sam. Amber? Hi, everyone. I'm Amber Harding. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Washington Legal Clinic for the Homeless, where I've been for 19 years this summer. Um, the Legal Clinic has been around for about 35 years, and our mission is to uh, use the law to bring justice to uh, low-income homeless and people experiencing poverty in the District of Columbia. So we have sort of three components to the work that we do. We have direct legal services where we provide free legal representation to people. We do a lot of community education and then we do policy and advocacy. Um, and all those, those three things are sort of intertwined in our budget work because a lot of the budget priorities that we focus on are things that come from the community that we work with, they come from understanding the programs and where they're failing people and where they need to be increased or gotten rid of, uh, depending on our clients' experiences. And um, so we do a fair amount of policy and budget advocacy around housing and homelessness and civil rights. And so I think I can, I can be the fastest person on the panel and leave it there. Thanks. Um, and for those watching, um, my boss, Council Member Nadeau, um, who I'm not here as a representative of today, but she's chair of the Human Services Committee. Um, and so Amber is often doing budget advocacy to me. Um, so it's nice that we have both sides here. Um, okay, finally, Sarah. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Novick. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I'm the DC director at Jews United for Justice. Um, JUFJ uh, is an organizing organization. We educate and mobilize local Jewish communities and allies to take action on um, issue campaigns, mostly uh, that pursue and promote social, racial, and economic justice. Um, and we do that in partnership with many organizations in DC. We're also um, in Maryland, Montgomery County, Baltimore, and Maryland statewide. Um, and uh, one of those important partnerships is with the Fair Budget Coalition, um, which I'm on the steering committee of with Amber. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll get into some fair budget issues, but um, working with Fair Budget, working with other coalitions that were part of like the Under 3 DC campaign, um, those are some different areas that, that we've most recently um, worked on the budget. And we can talk more about those, I'm sure, in a little while. I might have beat you, Amber, in my quick introduction. I think you did. <laughs> um, good job, everyone. Um, and for those on the webinar, um, two quick notes. Um, so the Q&A function is open. Um, please feel free to drop a question in there anytime you want. Um, we will reserve about 15 minutes at the end to get to audience questions, but if there is something um, that makes sense to respond to in real time, we can do that. Um, related to that, um, all of us on this panel uh, do a lot of budget advocacy work um, and have been in the space, um, I think, for, for quite a while. So I want to be aware of any jargon that comes up that we may not realize is jargon. So if there's anything that comes up that you are confused about, please don't hesitate to drop that in as a question, and we'll make sure we pause and clarify. Um, 
So to get us started, um, I just want to cast this question to the whole group. Not all of you need to respond. Um, but if somebody is on here, uh, either as an individual or um, as part of a, another local nonprofit, why should they get involved in DC local budget advocacy specifically, um, especially if they are new to this work? I can start us off. So I know we're all really, all the panelists are really entrenched in it. So it's like hard for me to imagine not being involved um, in the budget, but it's just so important. It's the biggest piece of legislation the council passes. It's the probably the most impactful thing the city does every year because it's just, it's the, the budget is, um, like in real black and white on an Excel spreadsheet, a demonstration of the priorities of the community, um, well, of elected leaders, not always of the community. And so it's just really important to know um, what, you know, what choices are being made. Like often uh, elected officials would be like, oh, you know, the budget's the budget. But really like there are a thousand choices within there that reflect the values of elected officials. Um, so from like, you know, Obviously, I focus on housing, but you know what? What's the city focusing on? Is it spending more money on police or more money on affordable housing? Is it, um, you know, what percentage of the need in the community is being met by the city? Um, you know, who's getting tax breaks? Are developers getting giant tax breaks? The same developers that happen to be contributing a lot of money to elected officials. Like, it's really insight into how the city is run um and to like how the people that you vote for are doing are they doing what they said they would do when you elected them thanks um anyone else want to add to that yeah um i can just also add i think for for us budget advocacy is extremely um important for anyone who is doing policy work or community work um knowing that the decisions that are made are made impact our day-to-day -day experiences particularly when we're talking about marginalized populations um and the budget has a huge role um to play in terms of what resources are trickling down um to us um the other thing to know is for those who um are engaged in legislative advocacy the budget is a piece of legislation but outside of the budget um, when we're talking about kind of creating these new systems, addressing um, various disparities that are uh, we might be experiencing, um, we can't have really effective policies and effective legislation um, without having the the dollars right to to support it. And I would say vice versa. Um, engaging in budget advocacy alone is also um, something that I critique often because we can't continue to pour money into failing systems, right? And so it does work hand in hand. Um, and so if you're committed to community, if you're committed to justice or liberation, um, the budget is a tool and just a tool um, to, to get there. And that's Prince, y'all, he's gonna be joining us. <laughs> you know, I, I appreciate his input. Um, yeah, I think you, you hit on something really uh, important there too, which is that um, one thing uh, people often uh, need to learn about at least DC government is that um, bills are not necessarily self-executing when they get passed and are signed by the mayor. Um, if they have a fiscal impact at all, they need to be funded um, usually in the subsequent budget. Um, you can refer to that as an unfunded mandate, but that is basically just how legislation works. Um, like you can't find the money within passing a bill. Um, and I'm forgetting the timeline. I think it is three years, but if you don't get legislation funded, I think within three years, it basically lapses um, and, and gets repealed. Um, so that is another critical part of this too. Um, so next question uh, I would like for everyone to answer um, to get more into how this work is impactful. Um, and I'm gonna go uh, Jeremiah, Sarah, Amber, Sam. Um, can you name um, one big budget win? This does not necessarily need to be in the last year, it could be over the last couple of years. Um, and 
uh, that, that is related to your work and how that has impacted people. Um, Jeremiah? Uh, absolutely. I would say what was impactful for us was, uh, you know, we had Division Zero Omnibus Bill, and it's a big bill, a uh, big comprehensive bill um, that has a lot of different pieces in there to, that I believe that will push DC4 uh, to one day hopefully achieving its Vision Zero goals. But it has a big price tag, uh, and we, you know, didn't get the last year. Uh, we didn't get the funding we needed for for the bill. Oh, sorry, the year before that, we didn't get the funding we did for the bill. But last budget cycle, we did get a funding source uh, for the bill. Uh, and the reason why this is, this is big for us is because uh, I know there's a lot of folks out there that don't like. Uh, traffic ticket, <laughs> traffic enforcement. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of folks in the audience who don't like that. And, and, and you know, oftentimes you can make the case that it's not equitable, you know. Um, but the reason why last budget cycle was significant was uh, we were able to get funding from new traffic cameras, actually, uh, new traffic cameras used to fund the bill for the, the Fund of Vision Zero uh, Omnibus Bill, as well as any future funding going towards um, a bike and ped uh, project, bike, ped, and bus projects. Uh, the reason that is significant is because oftentimes uh, money from the, these traffic cameras usually go to the general fund and then actually go on to actually fix the, to actually sustainable solutions that actually, actually lead to preventing traffic deaths, right? So people can make a case that like, all these traffic fines will actually lead to actually any solution. But now we're actually moving in a way where funding from that actually will be used to prevent traffic fatalities and deaths, will be used to fix roads, you know, which is the purpose, right? We want to actually make sure we don't need them anymore. We want to actually phase out traffic fines, right? Because we want to fix the road, we want to change the infrastructure. And hopefully uh, last year budget will be the first step in moving us towards that solution. Now we, that was, I consider that a big victory uh, in itself because there's so many different ways. Thanks Jeremiah. And we might be able to dig into the mechanics of that funding source a little more because I think it's, it's an interesting bit of budget wizardry. Um, Sarah, go ahead. Yeah, um, in my introduction, I, I referenced uh, our JOFJ's involvement in the Under 3DC coalition. Under 3DC works to implement the birth to three law, which is um, a law that's made up of many programs um, to support families with kids with, with very young children, um, ages zero to three, around health supports, behavioral health supports, education, um, child care broadly, um, and, and education specifically. Um, and it is a very long-term effort to get the law funded. Um, it will cost hundreds of millions of dollars when it's fully funded. And so we're inching our way there. And, and every year, um, our advocacy to get it funded is really important. This year, it was much, it was a, actually a series of much smaller asks than last year, but um, want to talk about those because even the small asks are really important. And we don't take for granted that even if we have a, a champion council member like council member Gray who, and council member um, Robert White, who really are very supportive and many other council members are very supportive of, of birth to three and, and um, the work that we're doing and making sure that it is funded, that, um, that we, we don't take for granted that uh, that's going to happen every budget cycle. So um, we had a handful of smaller asks this year to expand um, the, the programs that we know are already working and already helping families to be able to help more families um, with young kids, specifically around those health supports and those behavioral health supports. Um, and this year we were successful in getting those funded and we're not successful um, in getting some um, expansions to home visiting programs funded. So um, again, we do our advocacy work directly, you know, to at, making those asks of council members, getting council, trying to get council members and staff to speak to one another and to work together to find the funds. Um, and we mobilize um, 
our base and support the um, the coalitions that we're part of broadly to to make calls to testify at hearings um, and to make sure that um, our elected officials know that there are a lot of people who are making these requests and um, that they're badly needed. Thanks. Um, before we move on, actually, um, follow up for you. Um, I know JFJ um, has worked on some other um, kind of big lifts like birth to three. What are your strategies for sustaining budget advocacy over the course of several years? Do you mean in terms of the the number of our folks who are making who are getting involved or or more? Yeah, I guess like how, how do you are we, how are we funding? How, how do you keep track it? of what's needed and sustain that energy throughout subsequent years and fund things a bit at a time as opposed to saying like oh we got this win this year we're done. Sure. Um, it the the big big goal is making child care more affordable and particularly more affordable and possible for families with lower incomes and we know that that's not going to be possible until we are making sure that child early childhood educators are getting enough money in order to be able to sustain their families and their lives in order to create a a system, a child care system that will be able to accept more children into it. So there are, it is, it is robust, it is far reaching. Um, and, 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 you know, we could, we could talk about it for a really long time, but we look to our partners in the under three coalition to, to help craft, we work together um, to craft what our yearly campaign goals are, what we think is possible to win from year to year, what our, what an ambitious win would be and kind of make those calculated um, decisions as we go along, knowing that it, initially we wanted full implementation of, of birth to three to happen within 10 years and we're a handful of years in and unfortunately it hasn't, it hasn't been fully funded um, every year. So we're still, I mean, I, it, it's a it's a really big question you're asking, David. Sure. Um, but but yeah, we we are, again work in partnership, and there are a number of different teams in that coalition that are setting the agenda, and and we're supporting that work. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, that's helpful. Like the importance of of broader coalitions to sustain that effort. Um, Amber, I think you were next. So I'm going to put a blog in the chat um, that kind of lays out where our, our priorities were funded and not funded in this year's budget. Um, but I will highlight one of them. Um, I think a lot of our work can feel very, like we set pretty high standards for ourselves and our advocacy. And sometimes we make incremental change or sometimes we with legislation, we're sometimes working to make things less bad. Like something gets introduced and we're like, that's harmful. And we're trying to reduce the harm. But the budget is, it's very clear that when you fund permanent housing vouchers for people who are homeless, that you are ending that person's homelessness permanently, right? Like that is just a very like clear, tangible impact. Um, and so this year we ran a campaign on rapid rehousing because rapid, uh, rapid rehousing is a time limited housing program in the city that uh, almost everyone who goes into emergency shelter is placed into rapid rehousing, regardless of their income or anything else. And then um, there's a time limit. And so during the pandemic, that time limit um, got extended. When the public health emergency ended, the mayor instructed the agency to start terminating families from the program. And through our advocacy, we learned from the mayor that only 3% of those families could afford rent when their subsidy was terminated, which meant there were 913 families being terminated. That means hundreds of families were getting terminated and were going to be evicted or displaced. And a lot of families choose, these are also 97% of these families are black, um, all of them extremely low income, 75% of them are on temporary assistance for needy families, so doing very, very low income people, many of them leave the city. They are displaced entirely from the city when the program ends because they can't find rent anywhere else. So this year we pushed really hard to reform rapid rehousing. We weren't able to do it yet in the actual legislation, but we were able to get about 400 slots of housing for those 
families so that they could transition from this time limited program into a permanent program. And that means like they won't get displaced, hopefully. Um, and that's incredibly meaningful to those families. And yet for me, I'm, I still wanna solve the bigger problem of rapid rehousing. And just this week, the council introduced legislation, permanent legislation to stop the time limits to make it a program that doesn't drop people off a cliff, but actually transitions them into housing that meets their needs. And so we, this is, I think, a good example of where budget advocacy transitions into year-round advocacy and that we continue to do the work to solve the bigger problems. Um, of course, as, as you said, David, once even if we get that, you know, fingers crossed, um, we get that legislation passed in the next few months, it still has to be funded. And so next year, when we're all talking about the budget, we'll have we'll be talking about the only way to end the cliff is going to be to fund that bill. Um, but this is an issue where we're trying to actually prevent harm, and there are people in front of us. These are our clients coming to us for representation in their termination cases. These are like real families we know who we can see because they earn like you know four hundred dollars a month, and their rent is two thousand dollars a month. We know when they're terminated, they're going to become homeless again. And so this, it's a very like concrete, real thing that we see that is going to prevent harm to these families. Thanks, Amber. Um, Sam, go ahead. Remind me, we're talking about wins, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so for us, um, there's a couple, a couple pieces that I wanna name. So I mentioned earlier, we do our work mostly are guided by the Black Youth Agenda. Um, and on that Black Youth Agenda this year were issues around um, queer affirming learning spaces, um, addressing gun violence beyond policing and hope in homes, which is looking at um, ending youth homelessness and um, creating economic uh, stable situations for our families um, in the district. And so on a very like low level, one way is that we engage and what um, we do identify as like wins is inserting young people's experiences into the larger conversation. Um, and so the rapid rehousing um, situation that Amber just named, right? On our Black Youth Agenda, young folk, and literally young folk are naming these, um, named um, to ensure that families are not kicked out or terminated out of their housing um, after the rapid rehousing lapse. And so Amber, someone, and Jeremiah also, but people who I've worked with for a very long time, right? Like you have partners who reach out to you, who see the alignment, um, and then we're able to play a support role and sign on to letters or testify um, or share stories to show how um, the rapid rehousing crisis is impacting young Black people in the communities. Um, and so looking at how we can support other larger efforts and insert youth voice, um, and then this passion, really three years, um, what we've been holding is a work around police-free schools, um, removing police officers, armed police officers from school buildings um, and divesting from that while investing um, in resources um, and, and people who would create care-based, healthy, equitable learning environments for young folk. Um, so far, it's been a three, four-year fight um, a lot of it has to do with the budget. Um, the first one back in 2020 was where we moved um, a $23 million contract that was sitting with MPD um, for MPD to be in control of the training and the hiring um, somewhat um, of security, unarmed traditional security officers. MPD was holding that. Um, and we said, those folk are going to be in our schools. It should be those who are in education backgrounds um, who are working with our school faculty to be holding that contract. Um, and so during the budget, we moved that $23 million contract from MPD um, to DCPS. Um, small win doesn't address uh, the, the root causes, but does support around making sure those security guards, and we have already seen the impact, um, are being trained. Um, we, it also, we were able to reduce that contract, um, and DCPS created 
a pilot initiative where schools were able to say, hey, instead of having 11 security officers in our, in our school, um, we're going to use some of that funding to get restorative justice practitioners, to get an additional mental health clinician, um, to hire some community members to do safe passage, right? And so starting to push people through the budget um, to think of other ways that they can spend um, dollars. Um, we also later, um, got a win through the budget um, and not to be too in the weeds, but through a portion of the budget called the Budget Support Act. Um, I was going to ask you about that, so go for it. If okay, you cool. Through, like, like, I don't know how to explain this, but- Take us on a little um, detour if you want to explain what, what the Budget Support Act is. Yeah, so the Budget Support Act is a supplement to um, the budget. So we try to look at it as the numbers and then the language that kind of puts in the container and the criteria around how these dollars need to be spent. Um, sometimes other things can go into the Budget Support Act um, that also changes larger policies, but for the most part, it's thinking about the Budget Support Act as a supplemental language to the dollars. Um, and anyone can feel free to add in, to that definition. So for, yep, go ahead, David. Oh, no, I, I, I can, but if, if others want to uh, speak more to the BSA, they can, but I don't want to divert too long on that. Anyway, it, uh, <laughs> it's basically like legislation that the term usually used is germane to the budget. So say I put a million dollars to establish a new program under an agency, you should have the legislative language establishing the rules for that program. Um, now that doesn't prevent council members from, or the mayor from throwing whatever they'd like in the BSA because it, it can circumvent some of the legislative process, which is not great, but it happens every year. Um, so there's a good degree of politics involved with that. Yeah, thank you for adding that. So um, the, Biggest part of the work in the past couple of years has been um, the divestment part of what in the MPD, the school and safety division, which house school police officers. Um, and so in 2021, maybe 2020, sometime around there, um, the council passed a budget um, saying that we will phase out school police officers over the next five years. Um, and start investing in alternatives to policing in schools. It passed through the budget, through the Budget Support Act unanimously. Um, and then this year, the mayor put a lot of resources um, in her portion of the budget to um, re kind of cancel that out. Um, and so we spent the past year organizing again um, to get the Committee of Judiciary to in their markup to say, actually, we are committed to this phase out. We want to make sure the budget reflects it. So there should be a deduction of um, dollars in the school safety division budget. And we need to remove this language that the mayor inserted. Um, and so as of, I guess, last month or a couple of weeks ago, wherever we are, um, the council voted again uh, to pass a budget that recommitted to the phase out of removing um, police from schools. Um, it is a win. We at Black Swan Academy and with the Police Free Schools Coalition, the goal is police free schools now. Um, but this phase out um, does mean for the next three years, we're going to continue to ensure that the budget reflects that deduction um, in the school safety division, um, that we are seeing fewer police um, in our schools, um, fewer interactions between youth and police officers and that all of the investments around school-based mental health, around violence interruption, um, around safe passage, that that is also all happening within the budget process. Thanks, Sam. Um, okay, um, my Thank next you. question. Oh yeah, can go I, ahead. Can I just add something generally that's relevant to, I think what we all have said is that sure. there are a lot of really boring things that happen in the budget. Like how many snow plows do we need next year? I don't, you know, like someone's having that conversation. I'll argue with that one, but. Okay, maybe that's not boring. I mean, it's critical, but kind of boring. But then like what Sam is talking about, it's like, it's really about like, what's your vision? Like, what are your values? What's your vision? And there often is, there are these places, there are these hot button issues where the mayor has a very different vision than the council. And so, you know, the mayor has a ton of 
um, leeway to run the city, but the budget is this place where the council actually gets to step in and do some accountability, do some checks and balances, kind of like narrow that accountability and be like, yeah, but we said this and this is what we meant and we're going to take the money away so that you can't do it. So it is like a little bit um, like when we're talking about like people getting involved in the budget, like look for those flashpoints, like those are the places where you're actually going to like lift up where those conversations are happening, where there are differences of opinions. Like when we talk about the budget, that's what we're all working on. We're working, if it were easy, if everyone agreed, we wouldn't have to do advocacy on it. We're doing advocacy because people have, people aren't like sort of automatically or naturally prioritizing the needs and the wants of the groups that we're advocating for. And that's why we're down there. So I just, I feel like we're all kind of saying that underneath what we're saying, but it felt like maybe yeah. we should. No, good, ad good addition. We, we can open that up a little bit more. In fact, Amber, I, I saw you talking uh, recently about how the response from a lot of politicians is, oh, well, I need to find the money for that, sometimes as an excuse. So what does that mean? Like, what, where are those decisions made in this process? And, and um, I guess question for all of you, um, do you advocate towards the mayor and the executive and the council? And how do you play those dynamics off of each other? Ember, if you, you wanna keep going and then we can go to others. So we had a lot more luck with the council than the mayor. Um, I think maybe just our vision for a gun for like affordable housing and how to end homelessness is not always aligned with the mayor and we have more people aligned with us on the council. So we kind of have a hard time, honestly, influencing the mayor. Um, and so the mayor, I, I just want to again juxtapose this, like at the federal level, you see the president sends down a budget and Congress like rips it apart. They do their own budget. It looks completely different by the end. But it's a like much longer, much more resourced process. In DC, the mayor puts something out and the council doesn't have that much time to work on it. And they don't have the same kind of like committee structures and staffing that Congress has to like to actually fix it. So often um, it's hard to make major change from what the mayor puts out. So the mayor has a, even though it's supposed to be the council's budget in a lot of ways, and the mayor is just, um, sort of making a recommendation. Council has a real hard time doing major changes to the mayor's budget. And so it's a struggle if we wanna get like a huge increase to a program, it is a huge struggle to get that to happen. Unless like we as a community come together and say like, pull the money from there and put it over here. Um, and last year we had a really good win on getting a pretty small tax increase on high income earners that went to programs like, housing and childcare and, you know, things that we all really care about. Um, it was a really big win. And then we heard from council, like, we can't do that again. Like we're, whew, that was rough, we're done. Um, we heard from people who are like kind of, you know, normally on our side who said like not another tax increase. And so we were kind of stuck this year at doing anything big. And on our end, the housing end, our stuff is all big because housing is a huge need, it's expensive, there's no affordable housing in the city. And so we need big dollars. Um, and so it was hard this year to really get, and we're not experts on how many snow plows we need. So maybe we're paying for too many snow plows, but I don't know that. So it's hard for me to go in and say like, take the money out of the snow plows and put it to housing. So um, those are some of the kind of restrictions that we have. Thanks, um, anyone else on that question? Uh, I'll jump in and say uh, I, I agree with uh, Amber. I mean, when the mayor puts something in the budget that we align with, I mean, that's a great thing, right? Because oftentimes it may stay in there. You know, most likely it may stay in there because uh, for all the reasons that Amber mentioned, a lot of the mayor's budget remains intact, you know? But um, for advocacy purposes, I think, um, you know, especially from the transportation side, we build relationships with the committee chairs. You know, they're like the, you know, the king, the kings and the queens of like the budget, the budget process on the DC council, the chair, the committee chairs are so powerful um, and have a lot of sway, uh, you know, outside of obviously Mendo, he can like make a lot of the changes uh, that he sees fit when it goes to the committee as a whole, but the committee chairs are very important. So I think from an advocacy standpoint, 
uh, for folks out there listening. I think it's really important to build relationships with uh, the committee chairs for the uh, focus areas that you're working on. Uh, for us, it's the transportation and environment, working with uh, council member Mary Che and working with the chair next year when she's off the council. Um, and yeah, it's just easier uh, advocacy, it's easier to sway the committee chair, you know, usually, especially if it's a war chair, you can identify, you know, different PowerPoints for which you can push the committee chair, et cetera, et cetera. So it's in general, I think from an advocacy standpoint, it's easier to push the committee chair than push the mayor who's like, you know, here's the budget. <laughs> That's it, you know. And now the, here's the community engagement. Here's my budget. Now here's the community yes. engagement portion of it. You know, here's a here's a dollar. Break the dollar up how you see fit. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I, we can get to the question that's in the Q and A of like how do I read the budget? But uh, one thing I would not recommend is the mayor's budget forum, which is often advertised because that. I call it like budget shark tank. Like they have all of the deputy mayors like make a plea for funding their sectors. Uh, and it might be a good way of understanding like what the different components of DC government do, not a great way of understanding what's actually in the budget. Um, and just to add to, to Jeremiah's answer there too, I realize this is kind of a self plug here, but like if you're doing this work, talk to staff. You don't need to go directly to members, um, especially around budget time, their schedules are really swamped and things in the council especially move so fast that staff in the committees are generally the ones that are able to keep track of, track of all the moment to moment changes. Um, and we tend to be a little bit more approachable. So um, I'll just say, don't be intimidated about coming to council because um, you can talk to whoever is working on that specifically. Um, it's quarter two, so I want to get to our Q&A. Um, if you have a question, make sure you drop it in the q and A. I I want to ask one more thing before we shift to that, though. Um, and anyone, feel free to answer this. Um, but uh, can you talk a little bit about the budget oversight hearings um, and the work that you do, whether that's organizing people or testifying yourself? Because I think that's a really good entry point for um, budget work and pretend there was a question mark at the end of that. I can jump in here. Um, for us recently, the budget oversight hearings has been mostly used as a tool to gather information um, for our campaigns, right? So we work closely with the committees to ask them to ask certain questions of the agencies. We look at um, the responses to those questions to get the actual information around how have these programs been working? Um, who have you been supporting? Um, what challenges have you been having? And all of that we then use um, as our fuel during budget season. Um, the budget oversight hearings can also be used for any type of more immediate adjustments that need to be made to the current programming. Um, it often highlights the failures or um, highlights what has been working really well. And so we tend to take more of an individual advocacy approach um, for the oversight if young folk in particular are experiencing kind of like immediate harm or difficulties navigating a particular agency like that is where um, we would have them share um, and the response is tends to be pretty quick um, where we're able to get those uh, kind of individual and immediate uh, more immediate solutions happening, but mostly it's a tool for information gathering and allows us to push the executive in a different way where we're building relationships with the government agencies. The mayor's budget forums don't recommend, but some of the agents, most of the agencies have their own kind of like budget oversight conversation or forum that um, tends to be open to folk that I have found to be much more helpful in figuring out what how to read the budget um, and what's going on with those particular government agencies. Anyone else on the uh, budget hearings? And for context, this uh, these are the hearings that committees will hold on each agency's budget um, for the director to present their budget and then um, for the public to testify and for the committee to ask questions. Um, but if anyone else wants to add, I think the, the the only thing that I would want to bring to this is 
the that budget oversight hearings um, come after agency oversight hearings for folks who are less familiar with the the broader like council interaction with like in budget season. And um, I think oh, the oversight, the agency oversight hearing process is also really useful for folks who are not connected to an organization. If you have direct experience with a program or with an agency or with a service that the agency oversight hearings provide an opportunity for anybody to come and talk about their personal experiences with that agency. Um, and that then like fuels data or like is provides some data to council members to then go like Sam was saying, go back to the agency and ask follow-up questions that then lead to us having conversations about how much money each of these agencies should have in 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 the budget oversight process. So just a flat like a plug for both sections of of, of the oversight process um, that I think also depending on the council member, there are council members that are really, um, really like appreciative and, and open to hearing that feedback and and me and I think council member Nadeau does some of that really good work there are others as well. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'll stop babbling, but. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, let's get into some audience questions, starting with, I think, uh, the most critical from Max, which is how do you read the budget um, to see if your priorities are met? Um, is there any demystifying you can do there? Um, I'm actually probably the wrong person to answer this. So I'm curious how you all um, both digest the mayor's budget proposal and to the extent you can follow it through the, the various committee processes. And I'll open this up to anyone. So I can start. I just, one thing I would caution against um, is like, don't base your analysis of the budget on the mayor's PowerPoint when she releases it. Um, it's often like kind of high level, but also sometimes pretty misleading. Like sometimes there's like federal money smushed in there that was pre-existing or like other things that don't really have anything to do with what she devoted this year. Um, there's very little context to it. And then sometimes reporters will just like go to that press conference and then they'll come back and be like, the mayor says she ended homelessness forever. And then you're like, what? where is that coming from? And then you look at the budget and there's nothing there. So I just be careful about that. I think this year I also took a like as a like organizational rep, a little bit of a like, I am not a 24 seven news source. I'm gonna sit with this and digest it and not tell anyone what's in it until I'm sure that's what's in it. It's very confusing. Like, like actually, like I, I've been doing this work for, like I said, almost 20 years. I still don't like read the budget and know what's in it. I still have to like ask a bunch of people, is this actually what this means? Is there another line somewhere where it should be? Because it is not a transparent, document. It takes those follow-up questions. Um, but DC Fiscal Policy Institute does, um, well, they put a lot of stuff on their website about what's actually in the budget. Um, they also do budget briefings with the agencies that community can come to um, where you can bring questions. Fair Budget does that too. Uh, it's been harder in the pandemic to do it, but we used to have agency heads come to our meetings and tell us what was in the budget, and then people could ask questions about it. And then those hearings, I think, are another way. But in general, like we put stuff on our website um, or on Twitter when we know what's in the budget. We try to make graphics to break it down. Most um, organizations are really only a few are like kind of broad. Most organizations that do this work are focused. So it depends on what your issue is. And then I would just like try to follow the organizations that do advocacy in those areas um, or just like follow up with people like you guys can, you can always ask me and I will tell you everything I know. Um, someone at Fair Budget often knows what's in the budget sort of more broadly or someone at DC Fiscal Policy Institute can usually at least connect you to the right person or the staffers on the committees are often the ones that we're going to and asking those questions. So that's another way. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I mean, uh, Sam makes a great point in the chat too, um, that no one person save maybe for the mayor's budget director uh, knows every single facet of this. Um, it's really, you know, split up, whether that's by committees, um, by the fiscal officers at agencies. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, asking people is part of the answer there. I, I will also offer, you know, committee staff um, our resources there because we're we're digesting this stuff too, um, and we'll often share with advocates things we find out as we're reading it, and vice versa. Actually, there there are a couple of things that we'll be alerted to from uh, advocates in that space. Um, anyone else on just like tips for understanding the budget? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this goes to maybe speaks to Emily's question as well about resources for staying informed, but um, I would I would sign up for council member newsletters, especially if the if there's a council member who's chairing a committee that you of like agencies that you particularly care about or programs that you particularly care about. Council member Janice Lewis George has an amazing newsletter that I think is applicable for folks in Ward 4, but also for anybody else who's interested in similar issues that she is paying attention to and is championing, for example. So I think like council member newsletters, those just show up in your inbox are great, but then like paying attention to local news is really important. And, um, and luckily in DC, we have a fairly robust, um, like for the set of like reporters and reporting that happens um, on the council level and then like just broadly political level. Um, and one resource that I really like is the Washington City Papers daily news digest that just like shows up in my inbox every day and then I get to read local news. Um, the, and there are a number of different resources like that that will just show up in your inbox that allow like anybody just to stay up to speed on, on on a lot of the issues that are happening in the district. Um, one more thing I'll add to, um, and this is going back to our um, conversation about the budget hearings, is that um, you don't need to be an expert in the fund source codes and comptroller source groups and a bunch of other jargony details of the budget to do budget advocacy. Um, I will often say to people that uh, at a budget oversight hearing, this happens, but it's pretty rare that, that somebody will testify and say like, we need 350K for this program and the chair will go like, oh, okay, right away and do it like right there. Um, I, I say that it is more about tone setting, um, which is why I think pretty much everyone on this panel um, will often organize significant groups of people to come and say something on the same theme of like, this is a really important priority. We think you should pull money from this to do this. Um, and just saying it in those simple terms um, and putting the onus on the committee um, and showing them how important that is. And then, you know, paid advocates and, and experts can follow up on the details of that work. Um, I accidentally um, said that we answered this question from Marta, um, but let's go to that one. Um, asking about um, committee chairs can't take money from other committees, um, which limits the work they can do. So how in your advocacy do you get around that? So I'm glad you went, returned to this because I was actually thinking as you were talking like a big, we haven't really talked about Fair Budget Coalition, but like the Fair Budget Coalition actually came together to say you can't cut housing to fund healthcare. You can't fund childcare with you know, some other thing that serves the same group of people. So it was like, that's sort of the point of that coalition. So I think we try to be very careful about when we're saying like, like human services is a good example. They have, where do you tell human services to cut when you're asking them to increase the program? Um, and that is a problem with the committee structure that you have committees like housing and human services that don't have real obvious sources of money to fund their priorities. And so often the committee reports are like, we want all these things, we don't have any money for it. So it goes to the committee of the whole. And then you have Chairman Mendelson has sort of a disproportionate influence over that process and what goes into um, which priorities of the committees to fund. And the council as a whole is not great about coming together and saying our top priorities as a council are one, two, and three, and we're all gonna like put money into the pot and fund those things. Like they really don't do that. And sometimes the things that rise up as priorities are also like ward priorities. And so that's the other thing. Um, I don't wanna keep picking on council member Nadeau, but it's just easy because, you know, 
That's okay. I work with her a lot. She actually like shares a lot of our priorities, but she is a she's a ward council member. If she wants to fund like um, street lights on something in Ward One, where does she get that money? She often has to like actually fund it through the Human Services Committee or get someone in another committee to send money for that, which is like not really the best system. <laughs> like that's that's maybe not how we should be doing. We things. don't love it either. <laughs> so, but it like that's how that's how ward council members have to get stuff done for. That's how they have to like get extra like you know, streetlights and whatever for their neighborhoods. So there are a lot of flaws in the way that we budget in the city. Um, I like to think about how we should do it better, but like, I don't run the world. So I think it just like, it needs like everyone to come together and think about like ways structurally to do it better. So you don't have those weird things where housing can never fund any of its priorities. Go ahead, Sam. If I can add, Yes to everything Amber said. And also in the current structure though, there is some leverage that we have found in that piece of committees being able to share or send um, dollars on other issues that might fall outside of their committees. Um, and so for the Committee on Judiciary, we've been doing a lot of work around criminalization and policing, right? And the Committee on Judiciary has like a lot of powerful people on that committee who, who chairs other large committees, um, from Council Member Che to Council Member Gray, um, even Bonds in terms of like the committee um, that that she chairs. And so we do look at it and we do push uh, council members and staff to talk to each other um, and talk to their other committees and, and leverage that to say, hey, this is the connection between uh, police-free schools and mental health. Hey, Greg, don't you care about mental health and don't you see mental health as a valuable alternative to policing, right? And so it is important for us to analyze who are the members of the committee and what committees they also sit on, because that is where a lot of the negotiation and the leverage happens. Not ideal, but that is how it currently happens. Thanks. Um, so we are at one o'clock, um, so I don't wanna keep anyone too long. Um, but yeah, I, I will just add from the council side of things um, for to be transparent. Um, I think one thing you can do to make sure that you have champions on your budget issues is make sure that your ask, whatever you determine it is, is incorporated into one or more council members stated priorities, which like we track on a spreadsheet internally. Um, that will often be included in the council members letter to the mayor making requests. It is then what they'll try to do, you know, working down their priority list in their own committee. And then uh, there's typically also a request made to the chairman who gets to kind of like recombobulate all of the committee budgets. Um, and often the work of setting those priorities starts earlier than folks think it does. Um, you know, like I already have some budget priorities for next year in my head for my issues. And we tend to sit down and decide on that priority list right at the beginning of the year, often, or, or you know, February, like right before the mayor does anything. Um, so getting your particular issue on a member's priority list um, is something that can kind of happen at any time or happen early and often. Um, so I talked for another two minutes. Um, so Matt, uh, I will kick it back to you. And thanks to all the panelists. Thank you so much. And yeah, I want to echo that. Uh, thank you all for being uh, with us and attending today. Thank you to our amazing panelists for giving us a little inside view of y'all's work uh, day in and day out. And thank you, David, for moderating a great conversation, uh, keeping us flowing forward on something we could have talked all day about. Uh, but I think probably folks uh, have other things to do. So uh, thank you all again for being here. Uh, if you want more information about um, these partners, the rest of the organizations we work with, uh, we'll be sending a follow-up email uh, with some information. Also, you can always go to our website cfp-gc.org uh, to find ways to advocate and get involved uh, with great grassroots organizations working right here in the DMV. So thank you all for being with us and have a good rest of the day.